time and introduction so people have a good understanding of the basics? I think so. Um, there are some people that are watching that have, they're either our gemology or gemology students, but there's also people that have no um, jewelry training at all. So I think it'd be best to start at square one. And if it's a little bit too remedial for people, I mean, someone will just, they'll just let us know. <laughs> someone will say something. But yeah, 101 would be a great, a great place to start. All right, guys. So if it gets uh, too elementary for you and you want to <laughs> hear some more complicated things, let's talk. But so diamonds start under the ground in what are called kimberlite pipes. And they are pushed up from in, uh, in those pipes through magma and effectively a, and effectively a really i'll say ideal form diamond crystal would be an octahedron and when we talk about an octahedron it would uh, imagine a pyramid on top of a pyramid that that would be the the physical shape so diamonds uh form in that form the best diamonds form in that form they're from the cubic uh the cubic structure and then are cut to different shapes of what you see in jewelry today so rounds and squares and princess cuts and you know you name it we can cut it so after being mined there's a couple different types of mines uh there are alluvial mines which are effectively the diamonds washed to the surface over you know the, the ground erodes after a certain amount of time and these stones are washed with rain or other means to the surface and then kind of buried at a very shallow level. Then there are bigger mines like the Mir mine and other mines that are, uh, you have to access the veins which are deeper within the earth. So you need big mining equipment. Primarily, uh, depending on the area, most of the diamonds found today are found in those big mines. That being said, a lot of diamonds are still found the alluvial method where people pick them up off the ground. And I've been to both, both style mines and they're, they operate very differently. So it's, a, it's just a, a, a big difference in how these stones make it to the market. So in either case, these rough stones will effectively go from there to a dealer. And those dealers are dealing in rough, specifically rough stones. Those rough stones are then transferred either to another dealer, possibly to a cutting facility, uh, possibly to another uh, third dealer. Just depends on, on the particular pipeline and the particular person who found those stones or company that found those stones. So those stones are then, let's say they're sent to the cutter and then they're cut to maximize value. And value doesn't necessarily always mean size. Generally speaking, that correlates very well. That being said, some stones are cut, you know, for a different kind of shape that is more valuable at the time. After the stone is faceted, then the stone will generally get graded and grading can happen by a gemologist or a grading service in the United States here. Uh, the primary, primary grading service amongst gemologists and jewelers would be GIA. There are, are other grading services, but GIA is, I would say, the standard in in the diamond business. And they are the world's foremost authority in gemology. So GIA will then take a look at each stone and they will grade each stone based on a whole host of characteristics. Those characteristics are divided into four, I'll say major subcategories, which are what we know as the four C's. The four C's are clarity, color, cut, and carat weight. So if we start with the easiest one, carat weight, for example, is a physical measure of the weight, which in this case, since diamonds are the same or very close specific gravity, that will correlate to size. So when we think of carat weight, generally speaking, most people think of size, but it's actually a measure of the physical weight of the stone. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute and I'll explain why to you guys. So... Uh, that's the first C and probably the easiest to think about. Then we talk about cut. There's actually two ways that we evaluate and look at cut. The first is the overall shape of the stone or physical make of the stone. Is the stone round? Is it pear shape? Is it a tr triangle? You, you know, what is the actual shape of the stone? Then uh, the other way that we look at cut is going to be 
the actual angles and proportions and how a stone lets in and pushes out light. This is going to be very important in almost every shape. However, it's only graded by GIA, GIA on round stones particularly. However, when we think of cut, we also think about the make of a stone. So you, as I'm sure many of you have seen, and if you haven't, you know, you can check out either my website or yours and take a look and at, at different makes of stones. You can have a really short oval, a really long oval. You can have a really squatty marquee. You can have a moval. There are so many variations in a particular shape that that make also becomes extremely important. So that's the second C. Then we talk about color and we talk about clarity. These two are probably, in my opinion, gonna be the most important because they're gonna affect price the most. So that's how I judge importance is how it affects the price and the value of a stone. So if we look at a color scale, the, the color scale was actually initiated and invented by GIA, or I'll say, not say invented, but I'll say perfected by GIA. Do you know, uh, actually, do you know this? Do you know why the color scale starts at D. I don't actually. All right, so I'm going to teach you something then. Okay. So right. the color scale starts at D because years ago when GIA was not in existence, there were many diamond dealers in almost every major diamond city, New York and Belgium and all over the world that had their own grading standards. So one dealer would say, oh, my stone is an a graded stone. The next dealer would say, well, mine's an A plus. The next dealer would say, well, mine's an AA graded stone. Then the next dealer would say, well, mine's an AAA. Then there were five A's. Then some guy would have a B and a C. So when GIA came into existence and wanted to sort of unify the grading, what they did is they started with D because nobody wanted to have a D graded stone. <laughs> so D is, that is the reason that we start with D as the, I'll say the, the most uh, white stone or the most clear stone. So when we talk about color, color starts at D, which would be colorless, and then moves down the alphabet, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, all the way down to Z. And then past Z, there's what's called fancy colored diamonds, like fancy pinks or fancy blue colored diamonds. So going back to the white end of the scale from D to Z, if we look at a D colored stone, and I want you to kind of, you guys to understand what, how they're being graded. So most diamonds are actually being graded face down and looking at the body color of the stone. And what that means is if you've taken a piece of glass and you've looked at it on a plane like this, you'll notice that the look of this color of glass is like a green or it could be like a bluish green or a, or a, a greenish blue kind of color. So when you take a diamond and you look at it through this plane, what you want to see is something that's completely colorless. So a D color diamond would be that stone that on that plane would be completely colorless. Now, as we move down the scale, we're going to move down in color, either to a, a slightly more yellow stone, a slightly more green, it could be a slightly more brown, depends on the particular stone. So D would be completely colorless. And then you know, it would start to move down. Now, certain stones are more valuable than others as we move down the spectrum. For example, a J colored stone that has a brown tint to it or a J colored stone that has a uh, yellow tint to it, the yellow tinted stone, generally speaking, would carry a premium, assuming all other factors are, are equal. So that's color in a nutshell, as far as the white color. Now, if we talk about fancy colors, Fancy colors sort of consist of pretty much every color of the rainbow that you can think of. And they range from fancy light to fancy to fancy vivid, fancy intense, fancy dark, fancy deep, and so forth and so on. And what, what that description is effectively a, a level of not just tone, but intensity of tone. So you can have a blue stone that's technically blue but it can be a very light shade blue. You can have a blue that's a very dark blue. You can have a very vivid blue. So it really depends on the particular stone. And GIA scales are a little bit more involved there. And I can 
what I'll do is I'll, I'll throw up some different charts in my stories so you guys can take a look and see uh, how they correlate as far as color. If we look at clarity, clarity is going to be the other important one. And I'll say one of the more important ones because it's going to also affect price. So uh, clarity will start at flawless and internally flawless and then go to VVS1 and VVS2, VS1 and VS2, SI1 and SI2. Some people will categorize an SI3 stone. I don't. Uh, I follow the standards of GIA. So I don't follow that SI3. Uh, then there's I1, I2, and I3. And then after I3, a lot of actually a lot of jewelers and uh, gemologists don't know this. There's actually C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5. And they're generally not used in jewelry. They're, they're what we call bort in the, in the diamond business. They're based effectively squares of non-transparent rocks that are actually diamonds. So that's how actually most diamonds that are found in the world are actually industrial grade diamonds and not gemstone quality diamonds that we think of in jewelry. So back to the clarity scale, the upper echelon of the scale would be flawless and internally flawless. And then as we move down, we see inclusions start to sort of show their presence. Now, inclusions will make a significant impact on the value of the stone and also the look of the stone. If we have, let's say a uh, I2 graded stone versus something that's an SI1 graded stone, generally speaking, the SI1 will be a lot better looking. And inclusions are what's actually physically going on inside of a diamond. So when people think, hey, what is that black spot or carbon? That's an inclusion. You can also have other inclusions like garnets, which would be a red inclusion or uh, a feather, which would be a white inclusion or uh, a lot of us know them as cracks. So these these different inclusions and their presence or lack of presence in a stone will define the grade of that particular diamond. So clarity, how you determine a, uh, a clarity grade is effectively on five things. There's the size of the inclusion, the color of the inclusion. So size meaning how big is that inclusion or, you know, basically how big are all of the inclusions. Then we look at the color of the inclusion. So is it black? Is it white? Is it red? Is it orange? So forth and so on. Then we talk about uh, the position of the inclusion. So you can have a really small, you know, line that's directly in the center, or we can have a really small line that's off to the side. So another important one would be relief. Relief, we think of as does that inclusion have a reflection or a, uh, another attribute about itself that makes it more prominent. So you can have a white inclusion and, you know, it may be off to the side, but let's say that inclusion reflects around the stone a lot, or let's say that inclusion has a sparkle of its own that would af effectively uh, change, could change the clarity grade depends on the particular stone. So mm -hmm. size, color, uh, we have position, relief and that pretty much sums up all the parts of that clarity grade sure so all of those four factors which what we call the four c's are going to drastically affect price now one additional thing to think about would be fluorescence so fluorescence is how the diamond actually reacts to uv light so if we look at a stone that when let's say either lights are off or in strong blue, I mean in, uh, in direct sunlight has a strong blue effect or glows blue under ultraviolet light, that could drastically affect the value of a stone. And that effect be could be because of how the stone looks under a UV light or in natural sunlight. Some photos, especially ones I see on Instagram are so highly edited and the diamonds look great, you know, in a photo. However, in real life, when the person gets it, you know, they look at the stone and they're, you know, and they're on their, you know, they're outside looking at it under sunlight. And they're like, why does my stone look milky? And they're sort of like trying to clean it and it's never really coming clean. And, you know, they consider 
they they look and they're like, well, there's no inclusions inside of it. So what is exactly is happening? And what's happening is the, the reaction to UV light. So those UV rays are exciting uh, the electrons inside that stone and causing a, uh, a blue or a milky reaction to it. Now that fluorescence could be blue, it could be white. There's a whole host of different, uh, you know, colors of fluorescence and that's based on chemical properties inside that diamond. So of each of those characteristics will certainly affect the value of a stone. So that's pretty much uh, a good rundown as far as the simplicity behind diamond grading and from mine to market, we'll say. Uh, does, sure. does anyone have any questions? We do. We have, um, I think, two or three questions that people have submitted. All right. Um, I'll answer them. I know that there, I'm, there's, this counter is never accurate. I, there could be a million people watching. There could be only one. But um, if you just go 